Hi everyone, this is Arkady Freckman. I'm a New York City personal injury trial lawyer. And welcome to Last Week Tonight, where we answer your questions and we talk about your comments. It's all about you, the viewer, on this episode. And court is in session. Let's get into it. Here are the most recent comments on our YouTube channel. Here is a Here's a comment from a bad boys 8240 and he or she says you literally just laid out my whole case lolz but i was in a two car wrecks in one day so we're going straight to sue would love to get some feedback from you i've been watching your videos for one year straight it's crazy how you have helped out in my case just for me learning and watching you on youtube yeah, thank you so much. I mean, we're happy to help. Just, um, you know, text me 347-566-9595. We could jump on a call. We could exchange a text. I'm happy to jump on a call, answer your questions, you know, um, however I can help. So two car wrecks in one day. Wow, that's bad luck. But if the injury is serious, depending on where you are, we could help you um, find a lawyer if you need one or just get some advice. You know, whatever you need, we're, we're here to help you. So, yeah, thank you for commenting. And here's another comment from a Madame Palatine. And she says, hello, I'm in the middle of medical treatment for my injuries from a box truck accident and a guy distracted in an SUV just rear-ended me. My pain is worse. I'm wondering what is going to happen with my case. Is it a second case? Do I have to sign another contract with my lawyer? Um, and this is in Texas. Yeah, so I mean, basically, you know, you don't have to go with that same lawyer. You could go with that lawyer. You could go with another lawyer. It's up to you. So you're in the middle of your medical treatment for a box truck accident, and then a distracted driver in an SUV hits you again, and it makes the pain even worse. So yeah, as long as you could show differences in the case, you can have both cases. Sometimes it makes sense not to have both cases. Like for example, if one of the cases, let's say is a box truck and that box truck has like a $10 million policy and you know that you already have serious injuries from that. And then the second case is like some, you know, small little fender bender where it's the same injury, it's the same treatment. It's just gonna muddle the waters and create almost like a, like a soup, make everything confusing. So in that situation, you may not want to have both cases. So it's really like a specific case-by-case um, -case basis decision that you have to make with your lawyer. But yeah, I'm happy to give you a consult if you want. You could text me or ask your lawyer. But yeah, that's usually how we do it um, when one of our existing clients has another accident. And then Reginald Williams says, wow, $27 million for a mild TBI case in Texas. Were there any future medical care for this one? And he's referring to my video where I talk about the tractor trailer accident, um, I believe. Yeah, I mean, 27 million, yeah, that is very high, but um, I'm not sure, you know, I have to look into that to see, because yeah, there was an 11 million broker settlement and then a 16 million jury verdict. There probably was some future medical care, but I think most of the money might've been for pain and suffering in that case. Um, and remember, there's no such thing as mild. Mild is a misnomer. It's something that's created by the insurance companies to just say, it can never be mild when it's dealing with your, with your brain, right? It's a traumatic brain injury. So it's a permanent lifelong brain damage. It's a life changing forever injury. So I believe there's no such thing as mild when it comes to traumatic brain injury. Okay, and then Master says, I was involved in a commercial accident from an oil field company. Pickup truck T-boned me. I needed multiple spine injections, blunt abdominal trauma, and physical therapy. Currently seeing the doctors as per my lawyer. Am I looking at a good settlement? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a strong case. You know, it's hard for me to say exactly, but look, you're, it's a commercial accident, so it should be a large uh, insurance policy with an oil field company. Pickup truck T-bones you, so it's their fault. Um, multiple spine injections, abdominal trauma, physical therapy. Depending on where you are and, uh, you know, what's happening exactly, it could be a six-figure or even a seven-figure case for sure. And then Ricey says, hey, attorney, my lawyers still haven't filed suit. They are waiting until closer to the statute of limitations for some reason. 
and I'll still be treating. I think the opposite side is cooperating well. We may not even need to file suit unless the demand settlement package is refused. Then I think they want to file suit. Odd, huh? I think they are using suit as some kind of last resort if they don't cooperate, which it looks like the adjuster is cooperating. Currently have three different firms working on three different things. Oh. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of weird. I, I don't know why would you want to wait until the statute. Remember, the statute hurts you, right? Because if the statute of limitations expires, it just means you can't file suit. You can always file suit before the statute. You just can't file suit after that deadline. So I don't see why waiting for the statute or get closer to it would benefit the plaintiff in any way. And then, um, you know, I'm not sure what you mean by cooperating, cooperating in terms of like they're being nice, they're answering your phone calls, they're talking to you, but it doesn't matter, right? Because you could be asking for like $10 million, they're talking to you, but they're going to give you $1,000, you know, they're cooperating, but like who cares, right? So in my experience, the insurance companies usually do not put fair value on cases until and unless you file a lawsuit and you have a real trial attorney who's going to take them to task and take them to trial. So I like to push everything towards jury trial, you know, right from the day Right from the day one, you know, just push everything towards jury trial. Show them that you mean business, hire your experts, your liability experts, your damages experts, your, you know, send them a, you could settle, send them a settlement opportunity letter, but you could do it when the case is in suit and say, look, um, I'm willing to settle this case for, you know, whatever you feel it's worth, five million. If you don't want to pay me, it's going to expire in 30 days, then we're going to go to trial, but at trial, we're going to be seeking 10 million and then see how, what that does. That's going to really push them, you know? Because I, I know this individual, he has a serious case. That's a serious case. That's a life-changing forever injury. He has serious, serious injuries. Um, you know, so I don't know. I don't know who the lawyer is. But, you know, if you need any consultation, just feel free to text me. I think you've texted me before. So I'm happy to chat with you, help you out in any way I can. Okay. And let's see what other... Let's... Uh... other comments we have here. Kristen Howell says, what is considered bad conduct? And she's responding to my video, jurors think differently than lawyers. And she goes, please help. I have a big case. I'm being in a deposition in a few weeks. I've watched all your videos. You have answered more questions than my attorney. I can't even get him to meet with me. He said 30 minutes before the deposition we can meet. I'm afraid I'm going to lose. Your videos have helped put my mind at ease somewhat. I still have so many questions. Yeah, so I mean, bad conduct, to answer your first question, bad conduct just means something that is unsafe, right? Something that is going to put people in jeopardy. Like the example I gave in that video was a trial I did in February of last year. And there, um, a developer who had like these mobile home parks in upstate New York, basically, his manager hired this or, 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 you know, paid like $300 a week for this machine. And the machine was going to be like digging up the ground because they had these pipes underneath the ground that were broken and the machine was going to help them fix these pipes. So the guy says, why am I paying $300 a week for this? I don't need this. I don't care about these people. He was like racist against a certain group of people. He's like, because a certain group of uh, people lived at this um, trailer park. He was like, I don't care about these people. Why am I paying $300 a week? Forget it. I'm not paying. And then the company came and repossessed the machine. So he knew that the pipes were broken. These are the pipes where the water from the entire, um, you know, the entire industrial park where people live, this mobile home park, this trailer park, uh, all their water would like run off into a river nearby. And these pipes were broken and they were jagged and they were sticking up out of the ground in multiple areas. And they had other lawsuits. They had complaints. And this guy just says, I don't care. You know, screw them. I don't care about these people. I don't want to fix these pipes. So that's like knowing there's a danger and your manager is like trying to fix it. You know, it's not that expensive, $300 a week. You know, how many weeks would it take to fix a few pipes? Maybe like, you know, I don't know, most a month or two. And you know, you're actually fixing it. You're saying, no, don't, I'm not gonna pay it. Let them repossess the equipment, you know, this um, construction equipment and just let these broken, jagged, sharp pipes remain. And then a kid was walking late at night and they cu cut her leg and she ended up having CRPS, the complex regional pain syndrome, very serious permanent injury. And we ended up getting a $525,000 verdict against them. So that's an example of bad conduct. But bad conduct is just something unsafe 
that puts people at risk. It's where a company puts their own profits above safety or where they just don't care or where they're so callous and indifferent like this guy, just reckless. But to answer your other question about depositions, what I like to do is I like to prepare the client at least two or three times before the deposition. So you have a date and then, you know, you go two, three weeks before and you prep to do the first prep, the second prep, third prep. You don't want to do everything the day of because the client is nervous. They haven't been prepped, you know, and it's natural to be nervous when you're going into like court. If you're not a professional witness, if you've never testified before. And so you want to put the, the, the client at ease. That's very, very important for the client to be nervous like that, to do everything 30 minutes before. That's kind of like, you know, saying it's not important, right? Kind of like... Uh, pushing it off to the side. That's not, that's not really good. So, and the fact that your lawyer won't speak to you, that's not really a good sign either. So, you know, feel free to just chat with me. If you have any questions, text me 347-566-9595. I'm happy to just chat with you, give you some advice and help out. And then Blue Fire says, how can I get in touch with you? I slipped and fell. I have a slip and fall case going on for five years. One surgery to my rotator cuff head injury, breast injury, concussion, several trips to appointments for treatment isn't till this day. I'm not able to use my arm, not fully functioning. Last year, the attorney called me firsthand. I was granted $10,000. I declined a few weeks later. He came back and said 50,000. I still declined. He came back another day. Offer said that insurance. Oh, wow. It's a really long post. Well, yeah, you know, I'll just, I'll just reply. I'll say, look, you could text me. Um, Text me anytime, and it's 347-566-9595. Um, and remember, it's a free confidential consultation. So meaning I won't tell anything to your lawyers, even if I know them, it's confidential. So that's important because people think like, oh, I don't want to speak to somebody else because what if my, my lawyer is going to find out and my lawyer is going to think, Oh, maybe I'm not so happy with them. And then they're going to not work on my case. No, 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 nothing like that. It's all confidential. And my goal is trying to help people, right? If I'm not trying to like take cases from other lawyers. In fact, I don't like to take cases from other lawyers. I keep saying that it's much better if you guys watch my videos, if you know someone who gets into any type of car accident, any type of personal injury, if you're going to contact me, contact me right away. I'd rather take the case right away if I'm going to take the case and just build it the right way. Because once somebody else has a case, even if people want to leave that lawyer, it's very hard, you know, to get a new lawyer involved. Number one, because the new lawyer has to share the legal fee with the first lawyer and they don't want to do that. Second of all, the first lawyer might have messed something up that can't be fixed. And so the new lawyer is like, well, why am I going to take this, you know, rotten thing that's already like, you know, it's kind of like you want like a, a brand new apple or do you want an apple with worms in it that has, you know, holes and and you can't fix it. You can't fix it. You can't fix it. So it, it's a big difference. So yeah, yeah. So it's better to always um, take the case right from the beginning and build it up the right way. But I think this person is basically saying that they're just not happy with the amount. It's a low amount. But yeah, I'm happy to help. Just just text me. We can jump on a call. I didn't see this. I didn't respond. This was two days ago. I didn't see this chat until now. And then Jermaine Johnson says, yes, I got in a commercial accident. Don't know what it's worth. Uh, well, yeah, I can give you a free consultation and discuss it with you. It's hard to say, you know, not every commercial accident is worth the same amount. It will depend on all the injuries and the liability and all the facts and where it is and things like that. So, yeah. Then Suzette says, great information. Thank you so much. Baja Blaster says, I'm 24. How would I possibly have a nine millimeter disc herniation, which is causing denervation in my legs after a rear end collision? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, that's a serious injury. Um, you know, even if you're 24, if you get into a serious crash, you could have that a nine millimeter. I mean, the recent case I did in August of this year, involved a 16 millimeter herniation. So nine millimeter, about half, a little bit more than half that. Yeah, it's possible, definitely. You can get that in your, and that was like a 32, 33 year old. So he was fairly young. 24 is really on the, 24, you shouldn't really have any herniations. Vincent says, 
and he's responding to my video, how much is my slip and fall injury case worth? He says, great video. I'm a little confused. An earlier video of yours said a shoulder with surgery settles for up to 120,000 or so. How was the limo driver able to get more than 300,000 in this instance? Oh, okay, I see what he's saying. Yeah, because, you know, when I'm giving these numbers, I'm just kind of talking generally. So usually, right, like a knee surgery or a shoulder surgery, an arthroscopic surgery, that means that nothing is really done other than they go in there and you have like a meniscus, let's say in your knee, or you have like a labrum or a supraspinatus tendon in your shoulder and they fix it arthroscopically, meaning there's a camera and there's a device that goes in and they see everything on the monitor. It's a quick surgery, like a 20 minute surgery. So those cases are usually worth, yeah, I mean, it could be a hundred, could be 200, but this particular individual who got the 300, he had a slip and fall and he had a more in-depth surgery. It wasn't just arthroscopic. He needed anchors and he needed some hardware and he had a, a more of an invasive surgery. So it was worth more. But yeah, I mean, actually we've gotten, I don't know where I said that, maybe that was a long time ago, but I take that back. I mean, even an arthroscopic surgery could be worth more. Like we, we had a case with an arthroscopic knee surgery and we settled it for, I think it was close to 600,000 or even more than 600,000 because the client also needed a total knee replacement even though he didn't get one. And we've had arthroscopic cases with shoulders go for like 650 and big, big numbers like that as well. So they, they really run the gamut. There is no such thing as like, you know, I know people want to know how much you're going to get, but you're just going to have to wait and get a trial lawyer, get somebody who's really aggressive and going to prep your case the right way. And then they're going to get you the maximum because there are all these different factors, right? There are all these catalysts that could make a case worth much more, just like there's certain factors that may make a case worth less. Like if you are not likable or if you start arguing with the defense lawyer or if you don't get your medical care, that could make the case worth less or if you're in a bad venue, Right, so there's there's like pluses and minuses. There's like the uh, positive factors to make the case worth more, and there are minus factors that can make the case worth less. So there's no such thing as a case that's worth the same amount across the board. And then uh, Garmal Muba says, "Hi, is it possible to refuse a settlement that has already been signed for payment?" Yeah, I mean, if you already signed it, it's kind of tough. It's kind of tough, I'll be honest with you. There are some factors, there are some ways, I think usually if it's like fraud or if you would, it didn't understand the settlement or there was like duress, but it's, I mean, in New York, at least it's tough to do that. Leonardo says, great video. And he's talking about um, my, my video where I talk, say, get paid for pain. And we react to uh, a billboard that I saw. Actually, it's true, I was driving to work, I just saw this billboard get paid for pain. And I was talking about how I don't think that's really the message that a personal injury lawyer would want to, would want to send, right? Because the entire idea is that it's not about getting paid for pain. It's about if somebody was negligent and they chose, they made the choice not to follow safety rules that, you know, every company should follow. And then they injured someone, they hurt someone, their choice hurt someone. Now you are trying to get compensation for your injuries because they took something away, right? They gave you this life-changing forever injury, which of course nobody needs, nobody wants. People want to live life and they want to have life. They want to have liberty, freedom to do pain-free activities, right? Like fishing or running or whatever you like to do. Play tennis, play golf, pain-free. That's your freedom. Go shopping pain-free, watch TV pain-free. NFL, whatever you like. You know, yesterday there were a bunch of NFL games. You want to watch those pain-free. You want to live your life pain-free. So that's liberty. And then the pursuit of happiness, right? You want to pursue happiness. That's, that's your right in the Constitution. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, what kind of life do you have with pain? What kind of liberty do you have with pain? What kind of happiness can you have with pain? So the idea is if they made the choice to negligently take all that away from you, all you're trying to do is get the equal trade dollar value of all that, right? But you're not trying to get paid. Get paid sounds like you're trying to, you know, win some kind of lawsuit lottery or get paid that you shouldn't be getting. <laughs> and you and that's the exact opposite of a righteous personal injury attorney who's helping a truly injured deserving client. You see, so that's why I didn't like the billboard. That's why I did a quick video about it. But um, yeah, I hope you, hope you find it helpful. It's interesting. Let's see. Let's see what 
other questions we have. Notorant says, I think it's a great marketing gimmick because of the shock factor. Hearing that you acquired some pain from an injury and could possibly make money would appeal to the average person. However, the specifics behind the pain is ambiguous. Oh, and he's also responding to that video, yeah. And then Just Suits says, you are right about those types of lawyers. I learned from you how to research for the right lawyer for my particular situation. I was hit by a construction company box truck and had an ACDF, that's anterior cervical discectomy and fusion, three level, oh, that's serious, done. But I knew how to find a trial lawyer that was experienced in both those areas and they weren't on a billboard. Yeah, usually trial lawyers won't be on a billboard, good trial lawyers. Yeah. Let's see what other questions we have. Viral guy says, what up, bro? What is up? Everything is good. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. <laughs> Absolutely. And Fit Truck says, I'm a truck driver, I think. Oh, I'm a truck that was involved. I'm a truck that was involved in a fatal accident. I was sitting in traffic on I-65 when I was struck from behind by a guy driving a super duty truck hauling excavator, hauling an excavator. The driver that struck me from behind died on the scene. I was not at fault because I wasn't moving due to the road construction. It was later determined that his brakes failed. My question is, I have had two spinal steroid injections and I'm having surgery next month, the fusion surgery that you mentioned in the video. What is my case worth? I mean, definitely if it's a fusion surgery, good liability like that, like a guy just rear ends you, you're stopped in traffic, you're not doing anything wrong. That could be worth many, many millions. It just has to be built up. Remember, you have pain and suffering past from the date of the crash up until the date of trial. Pain and suffering future based on your age from the date of the trial and for the rest of your life according to those life expectancy averages. And then you have lost wages. You have uh, future medical expenses. Uh, so, yeah, it could be big. It could be multi-million, five million, ten million. It's hard for me to say without reviewing everything, but... If you need a consultation, just text me, 347-566-9595. And remember the video I did where you could also sue other parties, right? There's like not just the truck, because sometimes the truck will say, oh, it's a truck, they have a million. That's the tractor, but then you have the trailer, you have the broker, you have the shipper, you have other parties that may also be liable. And so you have to look at that as well. And plus you have excess and umbrella coverage which I'm still surprised the lawyers just don't find out. All you have to do is ask, but they're just like, one guy, I, I, I told the story before, one guy just said, I don't even want to know. <laughs> you don't want to know? <laughs> I don't know, but why wouldn't you want to know? It's crazy. Okay, here's Prince Drip Ion. Hey, quick question. I had to borrow 32K over the course of this last year due to multiple surgeries. I called a few weeks ago to ask how much interest has gone up so far, and they told me I owe 52K. My lawyer told me not to worry too much because they say they can negotiate the interest down when the case settles in what they say should be the end of this month to early next month, which I don't, I mean, they're Beverly, well, there's some name of a law firm and supposed to be good, but I just don't know. Yeah, so I would say, yeah, make sure the interest is capped, right? So the 3K doesn't keep going up. I mean, 3K, I mean, I'm sorry, 32K is you know, significant, but you don't want it to keep going up forever, right? So 32K, if it's capped at like double, which is about 60, if it's even triple, it's capped at like 80 or 90, okay, fine. But don't have the 32K turn into 300K, right? So some of these fundings are uncapped, so you want to have a ceiling on it. And then the other thing is, um, you know, I would ask them, why do they think that the case is going to settle by the end of the month? I mean, do they have a good reason to think so? Like, for example, the adjuster said, I'm reviewing the case. I have a real money offer. I just need a little bit more authority. I'm going to get you your demand by the end of the month. If they've been promised, that's one thing. But if they're just trying to like get you off the phone and say, and blindly guessing and saying, we're going to settle by the end of the month and making false promises, well, that's, you know, obviously that's, that's just terrible. And he says, um, yeah, at first they were saying it by the end of the year and then it became two weeks and now it feels like it's in limbo. Um, and they never say why they think it's about to settle. But, you know, I don't know. It's hard for me to say, comment on a case, you know, without looking at the case. But 
it does seem kind of weird. You know, I would definitely try to get the case settled. But remember, the, 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 the key isn't just to get the case settled. It's to get the case settled for the right number. It's better to wait a little bit, but get it settled for like triple, you know, what you would get today. But, you know, just like, hey, I need to settle today. Okay, here's 10 grand. But if you would have waited, it wouldn't be 10 grand. It would be like 300 grand. So, of course, you want to you want to wait in that situation. So, yeah, so... But feel free to text me as well if you have any questions. I'm happy to chat with you and help out. Okay, we're like at the 25 minute mark. Maybe do like one or two more questions. Um, here's a question from a Pedro. He says, I was hit by a commercial semi truck this past. 12th of December. The car was totaled. I had injuries in my wrist, back, neck, and head. After many tests like x-rays, MRIs, CAT scans, and concussion testing, they detected a mild TBI, post-concussion, two bulging discs, L4, L5, L5S1, and a few other things. I don't have anything broken. My physiatrist referred me to a neurologist. I have attended 12 therapy sessions with the chiropractor so far and have had a sacroiliac injection a lumbar trigger injection, and I'm scheduled for an epidural as well this next week. Um, I have not been able to work in almost two months since the accident. I'm not at fault, 100%. My question is, how much could my case be worth, more or less? Well, I mean, if it's a true traumatic brain injury, that could be worth millions, you know, as long as the policy is there, if you have the excess, the umbrella. If it's not, you know, that much, it still could be worth six figures. And the other injuries you mentioned are worth a lot too, like sacroiliac joint and, uh, you know, bulging discs, especially if you do something for them, like an epidural or a percutaneous discectomy. And depending on where it is, um, yeah, it could be worth a lot. Just, you know, like I said to others, just feel free to text me if you want like a specific consultation. I'm happy to do that. Um, but it's hard for me to just say what it's going to be worth from a comment, you know, just from a, even the you know, comment was pretty specific, but still without knowing the venue, without knowing more. Okay. And Notaran says, I like this breakdown in response to our video. How much is my case worth? Overview. It is specifically thought out and not as directly concise like some other geriatric lawyers on here. That is such a bother. Thanks, Mr. Frecht, as always. Also, I would love to see you in lawyer mode, LOL. Hear me out. I know those glasses come off, but it's time for trial. Oh, yeah, I gotta <laughs> go in there and get some big verdicts and get really ready for trial. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, also, I'm going to do more videos about this because that was the overview about how much my case is worth. But I want to outline some of those factors, like the major factor being liability, of course, right? Who's at fault and damages. But then other factors being you, the plaintiff, and how to present yourself. Other factors being your lawyer. Other factors being, hey, who's the insurance company? What's the venue? And like each factor maybe deserves its own video with a little bit of a explanation and how everything comes back together. So yeah, I'm happy to do more videos about that. Cause that seems to be one of the number one questions people ask is how much am I going to get? Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Please like, and subscribe to our channel. Um, let us know what questions you have. Leave us a comment. You see, we answer the comments in these videos where we answer your frequently asked questions. We also do lives where you can join us live and ask questions live. And we're going to answer your questions live. And if you have a specific need for a consultation, just text me 347-566-9595 and I'm happy to jump on a call, answer your questions. Okay, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.